Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Alzheimer's Live chat on music therapy for dementia. My name is Lakeland Hogan, and I am the gerontologist and caregiver advocate with Home Instead Senior Care. I again want to thank you so much for being part of today's webinar. Our live chats are brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care, a network of locally owned franchise offices. The Home Instead Senior Care Network offers in-home care with an individualized approach to helping keep your older adult loved ones safe and independent at home. To learn more, you can visit homeinstead.com. And before we get started, I'm going to go over just a couple housekeeping items. First of all, we have muted all of your lines to reduce any background noise. So please do not uh, hesitate to move around. Um, you know, if the dog barks or somebody rings the doorbell, don't worry, we can't hear you. Uh, so feel free to go about your daily life. Uh, we, we can't hear you on our line. But if you do have questions, we want you to type those in. Feel free to enter questions into the question box at any time. Um, no question is a silly question. We're happy to take all of your questions there in the question box. And don't worry about taking notes either because we do record these live chats and then we will email the link to the live chat recording uh, via email to you after the conclusion of today's webinar. So if you are really interested in the topic, want to listen to it again, or you think it'd be a good uh, live chat to pass along to a family member or a friend, uh, when you get that email, certainly pass that link along and share it with whoever you feel would benefit. So for today's topic, I mentioned music therapy, and music is something that's present across cultures, and it's a large part of our everyday lives. For those with Alzheimer's and other dementias, music can be beneficial for cognition and behavioral symptoms. There have been documentaries and movies made about the power of music for those living with Alzheimer's disease. And one of my favorites is the Glenn Campbell movie, I'll Be Me. And if you didn't know, Glenn Campbell, famous country music star, had developed Alzheimer's disease and he actually passed away yesterday. So we send our condolences to the Campbell family. But the All Be Me movie um, is, is really unique because it follows him on his final tour and he tours along with his wife and his kids. His kids are actually his band members. And it's amazing to see, um, you know, before and after a show, he is exhibiting the behavioral symptoms of Alzheimer's. You can see it very um, pronounced in his everyday life. But the minute he steps on stage and gets that guitar in his hand, it's like no time has passed and like he has no disease at all that's affecting his brain. He can sing and he can play guitar, um, at least at that stage in, in his disease. So it was so moving to see the power that music can have. And so that's why I'm so excited for our topic today, Music Therapy for Dementia. And we have a wonderful expert with us, Rochelle Norman. Rochelle has a master's level, uh, or she's a master's level board certified music therapist and is founder of Soundscaping Source where her mission is to bring meaningful music experiences to older adults and their caregivers all the way to end of life. Rochelle has been in clinical practice as a music therapist since 2004, and she maintains a private practice in Kansas City where her team serves older adults in senior living and hospice. Rochelle is on the faculty of St. Mary of the Woods College and is a frequent presenter at regional and national music therapy conferences and is, an, is in demand as a speaker, consultant, and staff trainer on topics related to music and elder care. Check out soundscaping.com to find a ton of great resources on music with older adults. So with that, Rochelle, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a unique topic, uh, and it's one we have not covered yet in our live chats. Uh, we don't often talk about music, um, but if you wouldn't mind just giving us just a little taste of what you do as a music therapist, to just kind of give us an idea of what a music therapist does or, and how uh, it relates to Alzheimer's and dementia and older adults. Okay, sure. Um, music therapy is all about 
making mu meaningful music experiences for people who who might be experiencing a, a wide range of, of challenges and difficulties for people with dementia alzheimer's disease other forms of dementia music therapy is often about helping people connect to the world around them to connect to their own past and their own memories and to connect with the people that are in their world for a lot of people um, as as the dementia progresses, we might lose our, our verbal abilities, our abilities for, to make decisions or to figure out how to get from point A into point B, but music can last a lot longer for people. So a lot of what I do as a music therapist is helping people um, engage in music experiences together to enjoy that experience of making music and being in the music, but then also to help them order what's going on in their lives and help give structure to the environment that they're in and the relationships that they're in. So it makes a little bit, the world makes a little bit more sense when you're doing music with it. So for me as a music therapist, um, in my clinical work, I go to nursing homes and I go to hospice patients where they live in their homes and play music with them. We sing, we play instruments, we move to music, we talk about the music and just kind of see where the music leads us so that we can have a, an engaging conversation or a restful experience or um, a really joyful music experience, depending on where people need to go. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that overview. Again, I'm just uh, so intrigued by this topic of music therapy because it can have such an impact on family caregivers and on the individuals that they're caring for. Uh, so if you're ready, we have some great questions rolling in. Um, our first one comes from Cindy. She says, um, does anyone else have the problem with music bringing the loved one to tears every time they listen to it? So is that something that you find, Rochelle, is a common um, occurrence uh, I know music can stir emotions. Um, mm -hmm. So would you mind speaking to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, that is a pretty common occurrence, I would say. I'm actually going to, I'm going to back up a step and talk a little bit about why music has such an impact on all of us, but especially people with dementia. I, I talk about the three B's with music and dementia as the brain, your background, and being together. As far as your brain goes, we know now from studies where they can take pictures of your brain while you're listening to music, we can see from those studies that, uh, that the limbic system, the emotional part of your brain, lights up when you're listening to music. And for people with dementia, the part that declines first or that decays first is usually the, the cortex, the top part of the brain where a lot of our higher level functioning happens. And then the middle part of the brain, the limbic system, is where a lot of emotions and the fight versus flight response and fear and motivation, as well as memory, a lot of that happens there. So even um, when these higher cognitive level things are declining, music can still get to that very deep level of the brain. And so that's why music can really make an impact on someone. Um, the other reason music, two other reasons why music can have an impact are because of the background that we all have with music. Music connects us with our memories. It can take us right back to that high school dance or our wedding day or the day your baby was born. You know, it takes us right back to that moment. So that can connect you to some very um, strong and powerful memories that might be difficult to access just through having a conversation. And then being together, music is something that connects you to the people around you. It connects you to your emotions. It connects you to the people around you. It connects you to your memories. Put those three things together and you have the potential for a really strong emotional experience. So going back to the question about music bringing tears, we know that tears don't always mean somebody is sad. And it doesn't always mean they're upset. There could be a lot, especially for somebody who can't speak and tell us how they're feeling. There's a lot of thing that, things that tears could mean. If somebody starts crying when, they're, when I'm playing music for them or when they're listening to music, the first thing I check for is to make sure they're not in pain, okay? So to make sure the music's not too loud or sometimes 
listening to music with uh, hearing aids in can be a painful experience for some people, or it might be a sensory overload situation where there's too much sound going on. If you can rule that out, then chances are they're having a really strong emotional experience or connecting to a really strong memory. Maybe aren't able to put that into words, maybe aren't able to tell you exactly what's going on, but the music is, is touching something very deeply. All of us know from experience that sometimes we can handle that kind of emotion, and sometimes it even feels good to feel something very deeply, and sometimes it can be upsetting or it can feel isolating if you're feeling something very deep and you're not able to explain that to somebody with you. So my recommendation is, first of all, as a caregiver, you know better than anybody else what those tears are likely to mean. And you would be able to make a better guess than I could about whether your loved one is um, just doesn't like the music or if, if they're having a, a deep emotional experience. And the other thing I would suggest is to um, just to be with that person, to be with them in whatever, whatever feelings they might be having. If it seems to be something that um, it's too much, then it's okay to turn the music off and just to be silent together. Um, and if the person can answer a yes or no question or shake their head, you can ask, you know, do you want me to keep playing this? And they'll tell you yes or no. And sometimes somebody who's crying, listening to music, doesn't want to turn the music off because it might be a welcome experience for them. So that's what I would do. I would make sure they're not in pain be with them and use use what you know as a caregiver to figure out what's going on and then ask them if they want the music on or off. Those are all great suggestions. I like how you categorize the three B's of music therapy, the brain, the background, and being together. I, I really like that. That really helps to put some good context to what uh, music therapy can do and why mm -hmm. it can be uh, effective. So thank you for that answer. Um, and you kind of already touched on this, but we had, um, Aristia had asked, every time I put on music from my mom, she yells for me to turn it off. So how can I get her to enjoy the benefits of music? So you kind of touched a little bit on this, but um, is there any way to engage somebody who maybe doesn't want to engage in music? Or should the caregiver just you know, give up. Any suggestions for, for our, our, I think it's Aristia is her name. Okay. Uh, well, one thing I would say is that silence can also be music. Um, there's a very famous definition of music, very short <laughs> definition of music, that music is made of patterns of sound and silence. So it's okay to have silence. And, um, as music has become more and more popular in relation to dementia care over the last several years, I've seen um, I've seen a lot of caregivers want to play music all the time, and that can be overwhelming for people, especially people with dementia. We're all day long; all of us are taking in a lot of sensory information. We're seeing things, we're hearing things, we're feeling things, and our brain works very hard to process what all that stuff means and what's important, what's not important. For somebody with a neurodegenerative condition with dementia, it's getting more difficult to process all that information. That's why we want to speak slow, more slowly to somebody and why we want to repeat things and, and why they might not like certain types of clothing and, and things like that at different stages of, of the disease process. So for that reason, we have to be careful about not overloading somebody with too much sensory information. So if somebody's yelling, when you turn the music on and telling you to turn it off, my guess would be that it's just too much, too much noise for them. And maybe it's time to turn it off or maybe there's something else going on that needs to be quieter and calmer first before they're gonna be receptive to music. Um, I work in a lot of senior living communities and one of the problems that we see there a lot is they'll have music playing, but then there will also be a lot of people coming in and out and having conversations and moving things around. Um, that's just that's just too much sensory information. And so people either get agitated or they shut down. So you kind of want to look at, at what other 
other noise, whether it's auditory noise or visual noise might be going on, that is just too much for that person to process. I don't think you have to give up though. <laughs> I do want to say that. Mm -hmm. um, there are stages in dementia, things change. So it might not be working now, but a couple months or you know, a year down the road, it could be a totally different story and you might be able to connect with them in a different way through the music then. That is a great point that, you know, you know, the dementia, the disease progresses over time. And we talk a lot about, especially when it comes to behavioral symptoms and using inter interventions like redirection and some other op options, you know, they don't work every time, all the time. So is the same kind of for music therapy. Some days it might work, other days it might not. Um, do you see that happening in those living with Alzheimer's or other dementias? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I like to think about music more as something that you do together. So if you think of music more as a shared activity rather than a treatment or an intervention, some days you feel like listening to the radio and some days you don't. I mean, that's true for me. Um, some days you want to go to a concert, be with a lot of people, and some days you just want to strum a guitar in your room. You know, there, there's a lot of different ways to experience music and to experience music together. So if one, one way of doing music isn't working, then another way of, of doing music might be better on a different day. And then on another day, no music is the best option. And that's fine because we're people. We have different needs on different days. And the best thing about music is that it's you can change it very easily. You don't have to have a prescription or permission from anybody to change it for the person that you're caring for. I like that differentiation that you make between using it as an activity. I like that, something that's done together. And you just mm -hmm. talked about how, um, you know, one day you might want to listen to light rock. Maybe one day you want to listen to some jazz or listen to the radio versus listening to a record. We had a question mm -hmm. from Laura. She said that her dad is 89 and she's 40. She's having a hard time finding music that he likes. So do you have any suggestions for family caregivers when it comes to trying to find music that they would enjoy? Are there any tips, clues, uh, those types of things that family caregivers can, or uh, hints that they can look for when helping their loved one find music that they enjoy, that they can enjoy together? Sure. Um, that's a really common question. <laughs> that might be the most common <laughs> question I hear. The rule of thumb that we always start with as music therapists is the music that tends to be the most important to us and that sticks in our memories the longest is when the music that was important to us when we were teenagers and, and young adults. So if you think about, you know, high school and, you know, you're going on dates and you're starting to listen to your own music instead of your parents' music and um, maybe you're in a band or you're in, you know, in an orchestra and performing and, and you go to college and you get married and you have children, all these big things happen during that period of life. And that tends to be the music that is the strongest memories for us, the strongest musical memories can be attached to that music. So that's what I start with. If I have no other ideas, that's where I start is with the music that was popular when that person was um, like in their twenties. So if your dad's 81, 81, is that what we said, or 89? Uh, 89. 89, okay. So then you'd be looking towards music that was popular in the late 40s and early 50s. So like some Frank Sinatra, some Elvis Presley, um, Patsy Cline, some of those are what, what I would start with. And then you could just try playing different things and seeing um, what styles appeal to him. Um, if none of that uh, oh, another technique is to go to Wikipedia. This is my favorite place to go. You could just Google it, but you go, you go to Wikipedia and they have all the billboard charts for ever. <laughs> so you could look up what songs were number one, you know, when your father was in his, when he was 22, you know, you could see what was popular back then and see if he remembers any of those songs. Um, the other thing is that we all we all have music that we prefer or preferred music and then there's music that's familiar so the songs that were popular when you were a young adult might be very familiar to you and it, that can be comforting but there might also be other music that you like that's not necessarily in that narrow band of 
of, you know, from when you were 18 to 22 or whatever. So um, you can try classical music, you can try Broadway show tunes, folk music, just play a bunch of different stuff and, and see what he likes. Feel free to share your own opinions too. say, I remember seeing this, you know, I remember watching the sound of music on TV. I love this, this song. Do you remember this one? And maybe that will start a conversation or um, somewhere over the rainbow was in the Wizard of Oz. So all of us have probably seen that movie at one time or another. So you could talk about that movie or about Judy Garland and see where the conversation takes you. Just a lot, just pick a place to start and then explore and see, see what, what he enjoys, what you enjoy, and what you can enjoy together. Those are some really great suggestions. It sounds like technology is making it a little bit easier for us to track down people's music preferences. So you mentioned Wikipedia. Are there any other you know, uh, apps or um, websites that might be good places to find a variety of music or um, any other suggestions that you would have for family caregivers, something that's easy, maybe pretty affordable, those types of options for helping to track down this music that can really be so special to their loved ones. Oh, yes, I love this topic. There are so <laughs> many places to find music these days. When I started my career, I carried around a little boom box and a box of CDs <laughs> everywhere I went. You can only carry so much music that way. But these days, if you have a smartphone, you can access pretty much all the music that's ever been recorded. It's amazing. Um, I strongly recommend learning how to use YouTube because YouTube is it's free. It just has commercials and you can find a lot of old stuff on there. Actually, everything I've ever wanted to find is on YouTube. And then you can also see pictures of, of the performers or slideshows with the lyrics sometimes. And that can be a really nice something for you to look at while you're listening to the song together. Um, you can also find film clips like I, I love watching the, the clip of um, Gene Kelly and Singing in the Rain, <laughs> tap dancing, the singing mm -hmm. in the rain, those kinds of things. I love that. Yeah. To share. So YouTube is great. And then um, I really like Pandora and Spotify, both of those, because, again, you can access all the music you'd ever want to find and you can follow trails and on Pandora, you can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down and it will build a channel according to your preferences. So that's something that could be nice if you want to help set something up for your loved one. On Spotify, you could listen to a big band playlist on one day and then a country western playlist on the next day and kind of switch back and forth and listen to a lot of different things. Both of those, you just need to have internet access and then a phone or a computer maybe a nice set of a nicer set of speakers that you could listen to and then you have access to everything you want another tip is that if you don't know how to use this technology you can go to a public library and the people there will help you learn how to use it the libraries in my area are really really good about helping people use learn how to use their phones and how to use things like spotify to access the music they want that's part of what they do so that's a good place to get that information those are all great suggestions and i know at least our public libraries here also have cds that you can rent and videos that you can rent so i mean the public library in addition to teaching technology if they don't have it i would imagine would be a good resource to just check check out different CDs and if they don't work then you're you haven't put in the money to purchase them you can go check out another one so yes I that's love a those great suggestion and a, a lot of libraries also have library by mail so you could even get home delivery of some of that if that's needed oh that's a great point I like it uh, we did have a question that just came in or a, kind of more of a comment Martha wrote in she said that her mother has a wide range of interests in music but one style always strikes a chord and it's patriotic songs like the Star Spangled mm -hmm. Banner those are very familiar and touch her memory every time so I know you've mentioned a few of the big artists that a lot of older adults relate well to but uh, it sounds like you know those more patriotic songs uh, are popular can you make are there any other popular songs or genres or artists that mm -hmm. um, maybe families could try first that you see frequently? Right. Um, well, the really important thing is that 
as I mentioned before, with the, the brain background and being together, the background piece, that's like your cultural connections as well. So your memories, but also the group, the larger group that you're connected to, which is why patriotic music strikes such a deep chord, because a lot of us grew up singing those songs and hearing those songs and thinking about what it's like to be Americans and then people who immigrated to the United States, also those songs become important to them. So that's, so patriotic songs, those are, if I want to get a group to sing, I almost always start with patriotic music because that's the what most of us know best. Mm -hmm. um, so think about the culture that your loved one has come from. You probably share that culture, right? Or at least to some extent. So think about the music of your culture. So if you, um, if you grew up in um, like where I'm from, I'm from Kansas City. So we have a lot of people in my area who love blues and jazz because this was an, an early home for jazz. So a lot of that music really resonates around here. If I go further out into the rural parts of Kansas and Missouri, we see a lot more folks who are into country, old country music. And we're talking more like the Western cowboy songs versus the more bluegrass style. You'd have to go Eastern into the country to get into that. So, um, so there is, there's such a wide range of music. It's hard to say, um, start with this song or start with that artist because we all have such diverse cultural backgrounds. But I can say this, uh, from time to time, um, I've worked with other music therapists and put together lists of like top 10 songs you know, from this decade or top 10 songs from that decade. So um, some very popular songs that I start with, if, if I know a person is in their 70s or 80s and I don't know anything else about them, you know, things like You Are My Sunshine, um, anything by Frank Sinatra, anything by Patsy Cline or Hank Williams, um, Elvis Presley, The Beach Boys, the Beatles for some of the younger ones. Um, those are the things that almost always people have some sort of response to them. Those are great suggestions. That made me think, um, does religious music touch people? I mean, especially if they grew up going to church or to synagogue or to temple, um, do, do you find that those types of music might be another good uh, place for family members to look for some music that will be soothing or comforting. Yes, absolutely. I can't believe I forgot that. <laughs> religious music can be very important, especially to Christians. Um, some religious traditions don't have that, but you know, whatever your family, what your faith tradition is, that music is probably very important to somebody who went to church for the whole life. And those are also songs that people tend to be able to sing because we sing yeah. them over and over again. Yeah, exactly. Well, and we, um, and you, you've talked a lot about the brain and how, um, you know, music is stored kind of in those deeper parts of our brain. Um, and we had Marilyn write in and she said, when my mother was in her final days, I played rock and roll from the 50s. She remembered the lyrics to every song and reached out her arm from the wheelchair. We did the jitterbug while sitting down. She didn't know my name, but we had a great time. So why, her question is, why is it that this disease makes someone forget who their daughter is, but remember song lyrics from so long ago? Mm -hmm. What a beautiful memory that is. I'm so glad that Marilyn got to have that experience. Um, well, why, do, why does dementia take away what it does? I don't know if anybody really knows the answer to that, but... I, I know. Uh, um, <laughs> One thing that we're learning about memory is that we used to think that memories were stored in the brain like a file system, like this memory's here and this memory's here. And we're learning more that memories are more like networks of neurons, uh, brain cells. And the more um, the more you exercise that network or the, the more you use that network, the stronger it gets. Well, music is something that helps us to encode memories. Um, like we all know, we probably all of us learned the alphabet by singing the ABC song, right? Um, and there's other things that we, we've learned with music. And so 
there's something about music that helps us to encode memories better than verbal information. And then music, just because of its, because of how, what music is, you know, music has rhythm, music has pitch, music has um, lyric content, music has harmony. I mean, there's so many different elements to music that light up different parts of the brain. And so you build much stronger networks with music than you do just with verbal information, which is mostly processed just in the cerebral cortex, um, especially in, it's called Broca's area in, in one side of the brain. So um, because music is a part of so many neural networks, when some neurons are dying, that breaks the network, but music is something that can build a bridge where there's damage or and can make a network stronger again. Um, or if neurons are dying because of this disease process, music is still there with another memory. And so you can access those music memories longer. It's just, it's just one of those, it just is how it is. <laughs> and we don't really have a good explanation for it yet, but it seems to have a lot to do with the fact that music helps with encoding memories and that music is so deeply connected with emotion and memory, the, that lower part of the brain, which um, stays healthy longer. I like how when you first started out, you said, wow, I'm glad Marilyn got to have that experience with her mom. And I think that that's something that as family caregivers, sometimes it's easy to get down and out about what their loved one can and cannot remember. But I think at the end of the day, as caregivers are reflecting on you know, did they provide uh, good enough care for their loved one or did did their loved one have a good day? You know, it's memories like Marilyn shared, you know, dancing mm -hmm. in the wheelchair with her mom to one of her favorite songs that can still be so meaningful and impactful. And I, I'm kind of like just tearing up right now, just envisioning, you know, Marilyn having that experience with her mom. And I think, um, you know, at least from my experiences with those living with Alzheimer's and dementia, they might not know your name or be able to say it, but they can sense your presence and they are mm -hmm. so appreciative of these moments like this. So uh, I'm sure you probably experience those types of caregiver situations um, from time to time. And I think we just need to encourage family caregivers uh, to continue to have these moments and um, cherish them because they are still so special. Mm -hmm. I also want to um, say too that, I mean, yeah. sometimes an experience doesn't have to be even as profound as that one or as active and, and, you know, it doesn't have to be singing and dancing and moving and for it to be meaningful. It can still be meaningful just to sit next to the person you love and listen to a song that you know that they loved, even if they can't tell you that, even if they can't say I love you, thank you for being here. Even if all you can do is hold their hand and listen to a song together, that can still be a very deeply meaningful experience for you as a caregiver, just to know that you're providing something that's beautiful for the person that you love. I mean, there's there's a profoundness to that that doesn't look amazing on like a video or something, but it's still a deeply human experience and that there's value to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, we did have a question that somebody wrote in on our uh, through email. Um, Amy, she had wrote in. Uh, it sounds like she's more in a facility setting. So I know we've been talking a lot about family caregivers, um, but a lot of our caregivers are caring for someone, you know, whether they're at home or in a facility setting, a senior care living community. So she, her question's kind of long, so I'll read it to you. Uh, but Amy says, um, what are key words for CNAs, that certified nursing assistants, the people that are working in these care facilities, to say in order for residents to have a pleasant experience having headphones put on them? And any suggestions of time that music will be beneficial for all of those involved? She says, our nursing home is part of the music and memory program, which we have about 17 residents using the headphones and personalized music. She says the glitch comes in uh, as teaching the direct care staff or the CNAs when to use this type of music therapy. So she says, is there any feedback that you could provide or any guidance uh, for helping 
those types of more professional caregivers use mm -hmm. um, music therapy or just this this type of music interaction or meaningful music. Okay, yeah, and these suggestions apply to family caregivers as well. Um, how to have a pleasant experience wearing headphones and then times to play music. Okay. Um, I will say that your your community is not unusual to have the the hitch of teaching the direct care staff of when to use that personalized music. I do a lot of consultation with senior living communities on their music and memory programs, and that's a pretty common hurdle for people to get past. Um, one thing to introduce music to people is to say, would you like to listen to some music? Just to ask simply. Sometimes the answer is no, and we need to let people say no <laughs> if, if they don't want to listen to music. Headphones are irritating for some people. Um, I'm even for me personally, I don't have dementia, but I don't particularly care to wear headphones either. I just don't like having things around my ears. If that's the case for somebody, you might want to consider getting a small Bluetooth speaker for them instead. Um, you can get those, I mean, you can get them as cheaply as, you know, 10 or $15 at Target and um, would be able to play the music through that little speaker for them instead of having to wear headphones. Of course, they'd probably need to be in a private space to do that or with just a couple of people rather than in a loud environment. Um, Another trick with the headphones is I um, have a client right now that one of the behaviors he has is that he um, kind of pushes his hands back over his head, kind of plays with his hair a lot. And so it, he'd be listening to music and then kind of pull the headphones off by accident. So um, the, the trick that worked for him is that we got some headphones that wrap around the back of his head. And so those work fine. So it might be it might be something like that, some sort of comfort issue with the headphones. That if you can adapt that, then the then the the person with dementia would be much more receptive to listening to the music that way. As far as time, um, that's that could be a long topic too. Actually, <laughs> what times to play music and not play music. Um, for one, I think offering music to somebody when when they're agitated but maybe before they start getting really agitated like if they just need something to give them a little bit of a uh, quiet structure music can provide a little bit of structure for somebody or a container for all the nervousness they might be feeling that's a good time to play music um, music is also can be helpful for motivating people it, it's something that's um, it's arousing for people, so it helps to wake people up a lot of times as long as you're not being overstimulated. So playing music in the morning when you're trying to get somebody up and around, before meals, during meals sometimes, um, is a good time to play music because that can help people stay alert and, and active during the day. And then of course, turn music off at night to help people sort out their day and night. Um, that's another consideration for playing music. The main thing is that you don't want to overdo it, right? Because it can be overstimulating and then that can lead to agitation or it can lead to people shutting down and not interacting with your environment at all. So don't play music all the time. That That's too much. Um, but play it more than zero. So you have to find somewhere between not at all and all the time. So easy, right? Um, and just, you know, with with professional caregivers with cnas give them permission to experiment encourage them to try different things and to use their judgment on when music would or wouldn't work and if and if it works out and they tell you this worked say great you did a great job you made the right decision let's keep doing more of that i think when you give some more power back to the caregivers they know what to do and who doesn't want to deliver something that's fun and beautiful and joyful to a resident? I mean, we all want to make our the the residents or the uh, the people we're caring for. We want them to be happy. We want to make them happy. So if you give some of that power back to the caregivers, then they'll probably figure out how to do the right thing. 
Thank you for those suggestions. And I hope that Amy and her community um, take away some good tidbits of information there. Um, if you have questions, I just wanted to give one more plug. Please feel free to type them in at any time. We're happy to answer those. The question box is right there on your screen. No question is a silly question. So again, please write in if you have a question. Um, we did have a comment that came in. It was regarding, you know, um, using music versus music therapy. So I guess my question is, is there a difference? And, um, you know, I guess, when would music therapy be appropriate or how would a family caregiver or a community go about um, you know, getting in contact with someone who does music therapy or utilizing it if, it's, if there's a difference? So would right. you mind yes. talking a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. So as we mentioned before, I'm a board certified music therapist. So I'm a healthcare clinician, music therapy is an allied health profession. So the term music therapy really is for the clinical service provided by a board certified music therapist or credentialed music therapist. Um, in my practice, when I'm doing music therapy, either uh, me or a music therapist is working directly with a resident and we're, we're shaping music experiences in the moment to address whatever goals need to be addressed with them a lot as i mentioned before a lot of times for people with dementia it's about connecting with the world around them or decreasing agitation and you know increasing arousal things like that so that clinical service provided by a credentialed music therapist is what we call music therapy and then everything else all the things that caregivers do that um occupational therapists do with music, that nurses do with music, everything that, that we do with music, or what I do when I'm, when I'm teaching about music. Um, we talk about music and caregiving or music for self-care, depending on who the music experience is, is for. Um, that's it's just a little bit of a language tweak. Now, as far as the, the clinical music therapy, um, if, you're, if you are wanting more music in your loved one's life, that can be a good time to consult a music therapist, um, either to get help figuring out some of those questions about why, you know, why is your loved one yelling whenever you play music or why are they crying? And if you feel like you can't figure that out, that can be a good time to talk with a music therapist and maybe have a session or an assessment to figure out what's happening musically that might be causing that sort of reaction. Um, or if you just want something deeper for your for the person that you're caring for um, music therapists like i said we go with the flow we, we go with the music experience that this person needs that's our expertise and so, so we have um families will have us come in you know we have uh, like a client who loved to sing she used to play the violin she can't play anymore she has a piano and loves to hear it but doesn't play anymore you know we want her to have more music what can we do and the music therapist comes in once a week or every other week and plays music with her and encourages her to sing sees if she can play the piano and someday she wants to and someday she doesn't um, moves to the music with her and just has that musical experience with her that maybe the family member can't provide something of, of that depth maybe they want a little bit more than they can do on their own so that's one reason to um, seek out a music therapist in um, community settings and senior living communities a lot of times music therapists are there to facilitate group experiences and to help people interact with each other um, which can be kind of tricky to do um, when you have a lot of people who are in different stages of dementia music therapists are really skilled at bringing everybody into the music together um, to have a really uh, engaging and enriching experience that meets everybody where they are. So that those are higher level clinical approaches to music in caregiving and music for people with dementia. But you don't have to be a music therapist to enjoy making music or sharing music with somebody that you're caring for. Um, so that's kind of the distinction there. Music therapy is a clinical service, but everybody can have music in, in their personal relationships with the people that they care for. Thank you for making that uh, distinction there for us. If a family caregiver wanted um, to reach out to 
a music therapist? Is there like an association website that they can visit to find one in their local area or maybe um, a facility that would you suggest contacting uh, a facility mm -hmm. in their area to find one or get connected? Is there a kind of best way to go about that? Sure, yeah. Um, the American Music Therapy Association website is musictherapy.org and they have a, a button you can click on the homepage to find a music therapist in your area. Um, you can also just Google these days. You can Google music therapy um, near me. If you're in a big city, there's gonna be music therapy practices in your area. Um, many, many, many music therapists who serve older adults with dementia. Um, you're also welcome to contact me. I know lots of music therapists working with older adults. So soundscapingsource.com, it's on the resource list. And you can contact us there and we can help to connect you with um, the people in our network that are working with older adults with dementia and the, and the kind of approach that I'm describing. Thank you so much for sharing that. And again, for those that could, didn't catch it, it was musictherapy.org, um, which is a, a resource that you can go to to find um, a music therapist near you. And I did pull up our resources page. We do have time for about one more question or so, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But I did want to pull up this resource list for everyone to kind of peruse through. And she mentioned soundscaping.com, which is Rochelle's website. So if you want to reach out to her, that is her site there. Um, but Rochelle, we have, I think, time for about one more question. Okay. And we had um, Carolyn wrote in on our Facebook page and she said, um, could you talk about the calming effects of music? Um, can you use it to calm um, behavioral symptoms of agitation? She says, mm -hmm. um, sometimes that works to help calm my husband. Can you speak right. a little bit about yes. that? Mm -hmm. Um, there are, yes, music can be relaxing. And a lot of us kind of stumble onto relaxing music by accident, which is fantastic. If it works, go for it. <laughs> but if you're if you're kind of thinking, well, nothing's working, what can I look for? Here's what you could look for. Music is going to be relaxing for somebody either on an emotional level or on a physio physiological level or physical level. Um, on an emotional level, you want to look for music that people like, that takes them back to a good place, that brings, you know, happy memories for them. Um, and so that's probably going to be familiar music. It's probably going to be preferred artists, that kind of thing. So look for music that they like. That can be calming for a lot of people just because um, it takes that music has a structure in time and so for people with dementia you're kind of out of time you're not really sure what's going on and how and what order things are happening it can be very confusing music is something that's a firm container a very solid container gives you some structure so that can be relaxing just by itself another thing to do is look at the elements of the music to find those elements that are going to lead to the physiological relaxation so some more things we know about the brain. If you look at, if you find music that's at an even tempo, at a resting heart rate, then your body is gonna tend to match that, that tempo or that rhythm. It's called entrainment or the ISO principle in music therapy. And so if you look for music that's about, you know, 60 beats a minute, 70 beats a minute, then your body's gonna match that and it's gonna, it's gonna help your body to slow down, to turn on the, uh, the part of your nervous system that's the re the rest and rejuvenate kind of phase of your of your nervous system. So the things you want to look for are that the slower tempo, slower speed. You want to look for a lighter texture, which just means maybe a solo piano or a solo guitar instead of an orchestra or a rock band. You know, just, just a lighter sound. You want to look for um, music that's um, rather than having lots of ups and downs and in, in dynamics and lots of exciting things happening, it's going to be something that's more like wallpaper sound, like the elevator music. There's a reason, <laughs> there's a reason elevator music sounds like it does, because the more blase it is, the more our bodies are going to tend to respond to that and relax on a physiological level as well. So, um, so slower music, 
simpler music, um, music without a lot of ups and downs. And then the other thing is to look for music without words, because when there's words in there, then, then your brain is going to start trying to listen to the words and make sense of the words and figure out what words are going to come next. That can be especially frustrating or agitating for somebody with dementia, as you would imagine. So if you look for the same music without words, um, that can be very, that can be helpful for getting that relaxation response. I would have never even considered looking at the beats per minute. That is so interesting to me. I have a thousand questions. I know we don't have time for them, oh. but that is really, really interesting. I, those are all really good suggestions. And the one about um, looking for music without words, because I know I find myself even uh, when I'm listening to music in the radio or, uh, you know, in the morning as I'm getting ready, if I don't know the words, I'm like, oh, what, what word comes next in this song? Or I can't wait to get to the chorus because I actually know those words. So I could see how if you have issues with word uh, recognition or coming up with words, how frustrating that could be for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia um, if they're trying to think of those words. And so instead of being calming, it could be somewhat agitating or frustrating. So I love those suggestions. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Yeah. Um, and then I, I had one last question. And um, you talked a little bit about um, you know, the woman that played the violin who couldn't play anymore. Um, could you talk a little bit about the use of maybe instruments, uh, whether it's mm -hmm. um, engaging somebody in an instrument that they may be used to play, or are there instruments uh, that are easy for those who have maybe the moderate to advanced Alzheimer's to use um, to become part of the music? Or is that something that you don't suggest at all? So I thought I'd just, our last question to wrap, wrap us up for the day, how can you incorporate instruments if that's appropriate? Oh, I love this question too. Um, well, if somebody has been an instrumentalist in, during their life, that's an important part of their musical history, their musical self. So if I can bring that instrument to them, just for them to see it and touch it and hold it, I'm gonna do that. Um, Realistically, a lot of people aren't going to be able to play certain instruments anymore. A lot of times it's not just cognitive um, limitations, it can be physical limitations too. So like the violin takes a lot of um, hand strength and it kind of a, a weird arm and shoulder position. So if you have arthritis or if you have um, neuropathy or there's lots of different things that could keep you from being able to play. But being able to hold your bow is, is kind of a big deal. Um, some instruments are easier to play longer, so a lot of people can play piano for a very long time. Um, wind instruments tend to be harder because you have to be able to form an embouchure. But if an instrument was important to somebody, I at least want them to see it. And then if you can play it for them or um, if you can find somebody who plays that instrument who can come and play for them, that can be really, really powerful for that person to be able to do. Um, in terms of, of simpler instruments, there are a ton of them out there. Um, I, I bring instruments into every session that I do. I don't always use them. In group sessions, I always use instruments. We use a lot of um, small like tambourines, um, frame drums. Sh there's shakers, different kinds of shakers that um, can have a really nice sound. And I look for instruments that are adult that are, are real instruments and that have a nice sound um, that don't look like kids toys because you want to treat people i mean adults want to play adult instruments um but yeah but you just bring one of those instruments in and you can just play along with the beat to recorded music um, and you personally can do it you can hold the instrument for the uh, person with alzheimer's you can hold the instrument for them to play the drum or something um, or you can even hold their hand and help them tap the drum if that if they need that kind of cue. And that's another way for people to engage in the music, even if they can or don't want to sing or don't want to dance. Playing an instrument's another way to, to be in the music. So yeah, I love that. I love that idea. Most of us can find a beat. So that's really all you have to be able to do is to find some recorded music and have an instrument and just add yourself to the band. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing those suggestions. 
I have really appreciated all of your insight, Rochelle, and all of the tips and advice that you've been providing to our audience today. We've covered so many different topics, but all within the topic of music and music therapy, which is so neat. Um, and I wish we could keep, I could keep talking to you for another two hours, but I know our <laughs> audience has to get going and so do we. Um, but again, if, if you all are out there want to get in touch with Rochelle, soundscaping.com. So, pardon me, www.soundscapingsource.com uh, is where you can reach her. And I also have some other resources here on our slide, helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. You can get plugged into our weekly newsletter uh, on that website. And if you're not following our Facebook page, Remember for Alzheimer's, uh, the site is right there. We have a great community out there. We're constantly sharing new articles, uh, resources. Sometimes it's just a funny video or uplifting comment. So check that out. And then also Confidence to Care. There's a great app that you can download to your smartphone with tips and advice on caregiving. Um, and then for any Home Instead services, visit homeinstead.com. The Alzheimer's Association always has great resources on a variety of topics related to Alzheimer's. So Al's ALZ.org, ALZ.org is where you can find them. And again, if you want to reach out to Rochelle or learn more about what she does or more about music therapy, soundscapingsource.com is where you want to go. And then if you're available on September 6th, we have our next live chat with our um, expert, Karen Garner. She's been on our live chats before. Wonderful, wonderful individual who is the family caregiver. Her husband has passed away. He did have Alzheimer's disease. So we're going to talk about the post-caregiving journey. There's a lot of emotions that come into play once your loved one has passed. You've been a caregiver for so long. Um, it's been such a big part of your life. How do you uh, cope with that? So Karen will be talking about that. So again, that's September 6th, and we will be sending you a follow-up email with the recording of today's webinar. And if you ever have any questions, topic ideas, um, anything of the nature, please email us at livechat at homeinstead.com. Ra Rochelle, thank you again so much for joining us and for sharing all of your great wisdom and advice, tips. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next month. Take good care. Bye. Bye.